Hi, everyone. Today is Wednesday, July 3rd, 2024. My name is Terry Lynn. I'm a recovered Al-Anon, and I will be leading this meeting. We want to welcome everyone to our Al-Anon Big Book Recovery Meeting. This is a step speaker meeting that meets every Wednesday night at 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. We will study the 12 steps by using the precise instructions out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as they relate to us as Al-Anons. Let's get our meeting started. This is the original AA preamble written by the AA Grapevine describing the fellowship back in 1940. We study the preamble with an open mind and an open heart to consider how it applies to Al-Anon. This helps us to stay focused on the message of recovery the pioneers intended while observing the traditions in action. Through the actions taken based on the instructions of the basic text, we comprehend what the pioneers meant when they described the membership of AA, which is that they worked a program of recovery and they no longer drank. In our case, we no longer obsessed over the alcoholic. Through continuous action and study of these principles, the understanding of the value of the original preamble reveals itself. We ask for your humble consideration of our sincere admiration of the pioneers of, the, of Alcoholics Anonymous. The simple hope is that we of Al-Anon will grow into the same clarity and unity that birthed the original 12-step fellowship, because without them, after all, none of us would be here. So this is the original AA preamble. We are gathered here because we are faced with the fact that we are powerless over alcohol and unable to do anything about it without the help of a power greater than ourselves. We feel that each person's religious views, if any, are his own affair. The simple purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves, regardless of what our individual conception of that power may be. In order to form a habit of depending upon and referring all we do to that power, we must at first apply ourselves with some diligence. By often repeating these acts, they become habitual, and the help rendered becomes natural to us. We have come to know that as alcoholics, we suffer from a serious disease for which medicine has no cure. Our condition may be the result of an allergy, which makes us different from other people. It has never been permanently cured by any treatment with which we are familiar. The only relief we have to offer is abst absolute abstinence, the second meaning of AA. There are no dues or fees. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Each member squares his debt by helping others to recover. An Alcoholics Anonymous member is an alcoholic who, through the application of and adherence to the AA program, has forsworn the use of any and all alcoholic beverages in any form. The moment he takes so much as one drop of beer, wine, spirits, or any other liquid containing alcohol, he automatically loses all status as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are not sincere in their desire to stay sober for all time. Not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and on which we can join in harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our program. Those who do not recover are people who will not or simply cannot give themselves to this simple program. Now, you may like our program, or you may not, but the simple fact remains that it works, and we believe is our only chance to recover. There is a vast amount of fun included in the AA Fellowship. Some people might be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity, but just underneath there lies a deadly earnestness and a full realization that we must put first things first, and with each of us, the first thing is the solution to our alcoholic problem. 
To drink is to die. Faith must work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. In order to set our tone for this meeting, I ask that we bow our heads for a few min, uh, in a few moments of silent prayer and meditation, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I wish to remind you that whatever is said at this meeting expresses our own individual opinion as of today and as of up to this moment. We do not speak for AA as a whole, and you are free to agree or disagree as you see fit. In fact, it is suggested that you pay no attention to anything which might not be reconciled with what is in the AA Big Book. If you don't have a big book, it's time you bought one. Read it, study it, live with it. Follow the directions in it and learn what it means to be an AA. And that is the end of the AA preamble. A sponsor is anyone who has had a psychic change as a result of working the steps and has the willingness to work with others. For those looking for a sponsor to guide them through the steps, please stay tuned and have your pens ready to record phone numbers immediately after the meeting. Each Al-Anon group ought to be a spiritual entity, having but one primary purpose, that of carrying the message to the Al-Anon who still suffers. This is our primary spiritual aim. Our job as a group is to provide people with a place to learn about and work the steps. It has been our experience that working the steps consistently provides us with a better, saner life. We consider all else to be an outside issue. This includes personal problems. The proper venue for sharing such problems is with a sponsor. This is, after all, where real recovery takes place in working the steps with a sponsor. We're all so glad we're all here and we're all here because we're not all there. Ain't that the truth? There will be a period of fellowship after the meeting. If you have questions, if you need a sponsor, if you need to check in or get current, or if you want to discuss other literature, please stick around for the fellowship. That would be a better time for these subjects. Okay, so it's a step speaker meeting, as I had at the top. Um, there will, this month there will be a, this is the first in a series of four speaker meetings. Um, and you're stuck with me for the whole month. I'm going to talk about steps one to three tonight and, and carry on throughout the month that way. And I think this is a five week month. I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to look, but if it is, I will share my my story at the end of the month if there's a fifth week. So anyways, uh, the way things are, are lined up with these step speaker meetings with doing steps one to three this week and then four to six and then seven to nine and then uh, 10 to 12, if we turn to page 164 in the AA Big Book, we have a synopsis of the same idea. Um, it says there, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. And that's steps one to three. And it says, admit your faults to him and your fellows. And that's four to six. Clear away the wreckage of your past is steps seven to nine. And give freely of what you find and join us. And that's steps 10 to 12. So that's pretty cool. Uh, to any newcomers on the line tonight, if you're if you're here today, chances are you're having maybe a little bit of trouble feeling at peace around your alcoholic loved ones, or maybe you grew up with one, and maybe you haven't had contact with that person for a very long time, but you still find yourself trying to con control and fix people around you, or Maybe there's like no identifiable factor whatsoever, but it just seems to you like you don't have peace in your life and it seems like it's the other guy's fault all the time. 
Uh, I know that was the way I felt, and I just felt like if only other people would see the light and would do it the right way, and the right way was my way, you know, if they did it the right way, then everything would be fine. And I went through my life that way, and, uh, you know, needless to say, with not a lot of serenity with that attitude. So, um, yeah, before I took the 12 steps with my sponsor, I had pretty much zero peace around other people, and it didn't matter whether they were drinkers or not. Just uh, for me, it was pretty much an equal opportunity. <laughs> um, person could misbehave, in my opinion, around me when they weren't doing something the way I wanted them to do. Um, I'm referencing the big book of AA. Um, before anybody's mind slams shut, anybody that's, you know, an Al-Anon member who knows that the big book of AA is not conference-approved literature, I'll just say that I've been in Al-Anon since 1992 and uh, didn't run across the big book um, using it as a tool for Al-Anon until about four and a half years ago. Um, and up, in, up until that time, um, well, for for the vast majority of that time, actually, I was not in a teachable mode. Even though I was going to Al-Anon meetings, I still didn't realize that there was a problem with me and that I was trying to kind of make things happen the way I wanted them to happen. And when a person doesn't have any humility, they're not teachable. Like, you know, you just you just can't learn anything. And that was the state I was in up until about 2016 when uh, circumstances in my life were such that made me humble in a hurry. And all of a sudden, I really wanted that spiritual experience or spiritual awakening that they talked about in the 12 steps. And damned if I could not figure out how to get it <laughs> from the literature I had available to me. And luckily for me, I have... Another um, issue to which I go to another 12-step uh, fellowship, and I stumbled across across the big book in that fellowship, and imagine my surprise when I found actual concrete instructions on how to do the 12 steps in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, yeah, I'm so... I'm so incredibly grateful. My my other fellowship is, I go to that because um, of a compulsive eating issue that I used to have, and I don't have now. Also, because I've I've gotten a, a spiritual awakening from the twelve steps again using the big book. So there are two ways for or two reasons or more than two reasons three reasons for alanons to read the big book one we gain an incredible amount of um, knowledge that we need about alcoholics and about alcoholism um, tradition five Part of Tradition 5 tells us that we should gain an understanding and, and compassion for our alcoholic relatives. How are we going to do that unless we find out about alcoholism, right? And the best place to find out about alcoholism is in the big book. <laughs> so that is one of the reasons to read this book is to just familiarize yourself with the disease of alcoholism Another really good reason for me, certainly, to read the book was to see that uh, although I thought the alcoholic in my life at the time, way back then in 1992, although I thought he was the one that was doing everything wrong, when I read the big book, the stuff that they said alcoholics were doing in that book was the same stuff that was going on in my head. 
And I found out that while alcoholics have a drinking problem, without a doubt, they have a drinking problem, um, that I had a thinking problem, like, like you wouldn't believe. So, yeah, they have a drinking problem. I have a thinking problem. What was going on with them was external, something I could see, you know, where a person was physically drinking too much. I could see that my ex-husband was doing that. What he couldn't see with me, um, it, it didn't make sense what was going on with me because I wasn't taking any um, mind-altering substance. You know, I had nothing to to blame it on. <laughs> you know, there was no alcohol involved. So I'm going to carry on here. I'm going to talk um, the best part of the big book, like I mentioned, was that it contains concise, concrete instructions. Nothing intangible, nothing nebulous, like just exact instructions that I could actually understand about how to do those 12 steps. So I'm going to talk about the big book itself a little bit. Um, we're going to turn to the title page really quick. It says Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of them, how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. So it's using a word recovered um, that word in most 12-step, you know, people don't really love that word. They like to use the word recovering. And it really doesn't matter what you what word you use. Like in the big book, they use the word recovered. I use the word recovered when I refer to myself as a recovered Al-Anon. And when I say that, um, what I mean is that in the past, when I felt unhappy about something, anxious, angry, whatever, what I did about it was I tried to control other people. I tried to fix them. I tried to arrange life to suit myself. That's what I did to try to feel better. Um, nowadays, I don't have to do that. Taking the steps with a sponsor has taught me a different means of feeling better. So when I say recovered, that's what I mean. I don't have to, of my own willpower, try to logic things out or try to fix things anymore. In my case, I turn to a higher power, and he points me in the direction of helping other people in an unselfish way, not helping people so that I get my way, right, so that everything goes my way. No, helping people so as to be helpful to them as my higher power would have me be helpful to them, okay? Um, I'm going to go to, again, about the big book, preface page XI, because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery, there exists strong sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. So I read this because, first of all, because it's, calls what we're reading here today a basic text or a textbook. The first 164 pages of the big book are a textbook. And back um, before Al-Anon became, you know, named Al-Anon, uh, family members of alcoholics studied the big book and they followed the directions as in taking the 12 steps out of the big book back then. Um, it was only later on that Al-Anon literature was developed. I lost my place. So um, they found it very useful back then, and, you know, we find it very useful here now as well. On the forward to the first edition, page XIII, this is a really important paragraph. We as Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing 
that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person, and besides, we are sure our way of living has its advantages for all. Okay, so as al we read the big book, and we gain some knowledge of alcoholism. That's great. But in our case, it is only academic knowledge, right? It's not personal in our gut, we know what they're talking about kind of knowledge. Um, one of the paragraphs I'm going to read you a little lower is going to talk about that a little bit for al -Anons. But it's still important to have academic knowledge of alcoholism. But we think to ourselves, well, you know, if they're drinking, if they would just stop drinking or if they would just have one or two, you know, then then their problems would be sol solved, our problems would be solved, you know, like it. And it turns out it doesn't work that way. The alcoholism is a two-part uh, illness. It's a mind and a body problem. And the body problem, as al are the ones that we're always looking at. We're always looking at how they're drinking. And there is much more to their problem than just that. So I am going to go to step one now. Um, I'm going to read from page XXBIII. And it says, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. The phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. Okay. So, <laughs> this is a doctor. His name is Dr. William Silfer, and he had written a letter. Uh, regarding what he figured to be a physical allergy that alcoholics had to a substance being alcohol. And at the time he wrote it, it was simply a theory of his. It has since been borne out to be a scientifically proven fact that alcoholics are, they don't metabolize alcohol like normal people, and when they do start drinking it, they get thirstier and thirstier and thirstier, and they can't stop at will, right? And if anybody on the line does keep company with someone who is an active alcoholic or did in the past like I did, they will understand that phenomenon where this person starts drinking and they may not intend to drink too much, but... You know, they, they go again, We and, and they may say they don't want to, but but they go ahead and they do it anyways. So this is why they can't just have a couple of drinks, because their body is not normal. Okay, so here we are, the al -Anons. How does this relate to us? So that's what's going on with them. That lack of control thing for us, for me anyways, was when I would start obsessing around the alcoholic, like my ex-husband, when I started mulling over all the stuff I figured he was doing wrong and about how he should be doing right and about how I should be helping him out to show him how he should be doing things right, <laughs> um, when I was doing that kind of thing, then I would be on a runaway. My mind would be on a runaway. I wouldn't be able to stop. And the resulting, the actions that resulted out of that ruminating and blaming and resentment and self-pity and depression and whatever, because that's what all that stuff caused. Um, the resulting actions were you know, being pretty darn mean to my ex-husband and maybe not taking care of my kids very well sometimes and being pretty darn cranky with them and not doing very well at work. That's the kind of thing that came for me with the lack of control. Once I started 
you know, like a dog with a bone over somebody that was doing something that I didn't like, then I would be off and running. I would have a lot, a lack of control. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the next paragraph on XXVIII because it's very important for Al-Anon's and it's in old-fashioned language, but bear with me. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are, re if they are to recreate their lives. Okay, so again, old-fashioned language, but what this... What this paragraph is saying is that um, the only people that can help alcoholics are alcoholics. <laughs> that the only people that help, can help them are someone that they believe has been in their shoes. And really, effectively, the only person that can help a suffering alcoholic is one who is a recovered alcoholic who has been through the steps. Right, two two drunks can get together and they can, yes, they they have been in, in each other's shoes, but they can't really help each other because one of them, because they're both still suffering. But if one isn't and one still is, then there is a useful relationship. So the reason I say this is important for Al-Anons is that one of the of our problem of Al-Anonism if you want to call it that, is that we try to get them sobered up <laughs> and we don't we don't know about this little paragraph here that translates to to telling us that you gotta be in that other guy's shoes before he's gonna listen to you. And it just is what it is. And it works the other way around. Um when I was losing my mind over my ex-husband all the time, if I had been telling a friend about it and she had given me a bunch of advice about what I should have done, but she didn't have an alcoholic ex-husband, I wouldn't have listened to a word she said because she didn't know where I was coming from, right? So the same thing happens with us. Uh, the useful relationship with us is when it's a recovered Al-Anon, someone steps that is talking to one who is not yet through the steps, who is still in the midst of their illness and needs help. That's the useful relationship. All right. So that control thing I was talking about earlier about how an alcoholic loses control once they start drinking because their body doesn't react normally to the substance alcohol, in my mind, loses control of my thoughts once I once I start obsessing. That's the first half of step one. The second half of step one, I'm gonna talk about that now, and it's kind of the far more important one, which is hard to believe as an Al-Anon if you're thinking about, well, what could be more important um, than the lack of control that my husband has over his drinking. What could be more important than that? Well, the more important thing is, um, what if he wants to stop? And what if he has told himself, I'm never going to touch another drop? And then he turns around and he starts drinking again and he loses control again. And then he gathers and and he makes another firm resolution and he says, I'm, I'm never going to drink again. I have everything to live for. I, I, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to get a DWI. I don't want to get a divorce. I don't, you know, we have every reason to not drink, right? But his mind takes him back to that first drink again every single time. This is the mind problem and it's, it's an intractable problem. It's uh, it's the essence of the powerlessness that we're talking about when we talk about alcoholism. Um, an alcoholic can not want to drink as much as they want, but their mind is going to take them back because their mind is not normal in that way. 
All right. So that's them. Us. My mind. You know, I would know that when I started obsessing around my ex-husband, I knew I was going to get very cranky with my kids. I knew that my my husband back then, my then husband, that we were going to have a big fight. You know, I knew that he was going to go out and have a bigger blow up, you know, as far as drinking than ever. If I, you know, if I couldn't keep my mouth shut, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I would say to myself, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to leave him alone. You know, I'm, it's none of my business. I'm going to. I'm gonna. You know, I would. I would repeat slogans in my mind. I would. I would clean out a drawer. I would clean out a closet. I would do whatever it was to distract myself to try to keep myself from getting back into his business. And it was all to no avail because my mind isn't normal either. <laughs> So my mind wants, it really wants to take me back to that ragging on the idea that there's something wrong in the world and I need to fix it. There's something wrong in the world and I know what the answer is. And if only people around me would do, you know, the right thing, that I know the right thing, then everything would be okay. My mind takes me back there against my best efforts to not go there, right? So I'm going to read, I'm going to read this um, paragraph. How do I want to read this here? I'm going to say Alanonics. Alanonics, think. I'm going to say think, you know, and, and that's going to mean think obsess, manage, control, fix, you know, all that. Alanonics think, essentially, because they like the effect produced by it. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, yeah, it hurts, it hurts us. They cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false to them. Their alanonic light seems the only normal one. I could not imagine not trying to correct my ex-husband's errant behavior. Like any normal person would have tried to fix him, fix him as far as I was concerned, right? <laughs> Anyways, it says, they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few things, I'm going to say, you know, compulsive thoughts, which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do in the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to mess around with him again. This is repeated over and over and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. So this is talking about that mind problem. This is what I was saying about how I would tell myself, oh, my God, that got me in so much trouble last time when I tried to tell him about how he should do fill in the blank. Like he lost his mind, you know, he whatever. It doesn't matter what he did. All I know is that it caused a lot of trouble. So this time I'm, I'm not going to say anything. You know, I'm just going to hush. But when I did that, when I tried to make myself through my own willpower, when I tried to make myself hush, then I would get increasingly restless, irritable, and discontented because in my heart of hearts, I was sure that I knew the answer and that other people needed to know the answer. <laughs> so eventually... I would break my resolution about not interfering, you know, or meddling or controlling or fixing or educating or, you know, whatever, managing. And then I would go ahead and say something intending only to be helpful. I'm just trying to help him, right? But that kind of help 
uh, who was I really trying to help when I was doing that? I was, when I got together with my sponsor and did the steps, she helped me see that I was really trying to help me because I was trying to help other people do things the way I wanted them to be done. That's what I was doing, all in the name of being, quote, unquote, helpful. That's a sick al way of being helpful. That's not being helpful in an unselfish way, right? That's being helpful in a selfish way. So at the end of this paragraph, the gentleman that wrote this, this uh, paragraph says, that this person is not going to change unless they experience an entire psychic change. And what he meant by that psychic change idea is um, a different attitude, you know. Um, if I do get a chance to share my story at the end of the month, if this is a five-week month, um, you'll probably hear that my attitude has changed quite a bit. and. If I were to tell you that I used to be a person that was just nothing but anxious and angry and self-pitying all the time, I probably don't sound like that now. And it's because I'm not like that now, because I've ha I have had that psychic change that is promised when we take the 12 steps. Um, I believe it's a result of that spiritual awakening. It's It's... In my case, my higher power is God, and it's God, um, you know, getting my head on straight, getting my thinking more in line with what normal people's thinking would be. You know, instead of everything bothering me so much and everything, you know, being extremely ultra-sensitive, things just don't bother me nearly as much or, or scare me as much or make me angry as much the way they used to. All right, I'm going to carry on here. So um, if we've got Al-Anons here on the line that are living with active alcoholism and they're still thinking, well, you know, if if an alcoholic loses control of his drinking once he starts drinking, why doesn't he just not start drinking? Like, come on. Why do, you know, if, if the actual substance is what sets off the problem, why doesn't he just not? Again, because his mind is not normal and it's not his fault. I mean, it said in one of the first paragraphs I read that the alcoholic is a very sick person. Um, as Al-Anons, we are sick people, too. And when it says sick, they're, they mean spiritually sick. They're talking about spiritually sick. Um, spiritually sick people like to fill up a great big spiritual void in themselves by doing other stuff. And when it comes to alcoholics, it's by drinking. When it comes to compulsive eaters, it's by eating. When it comes to hoarders, it's by hoarding. When it comes to al -Anons, it's by controlling, managing, fixing other people. That's what we do to, to fill up that big spiritual void, okay? The 12 steps are the substitute that we fill up that spiritual void with. And, of course, it's a useful way to fill it up, right? Um, on page 23, it says, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took that first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic and the alanonic centers in his mind rather than his body. So, yeah, a mind problem, big time. Um, you know, we don't have the body problem they have, but... Once we get on a roll with, with our resentments and self-pity and obsessing and whatever, then we're on a runaway, right? And again, like I was saying before, we can make those firm resolutions to not do it again, but we do it again. On page 24, it's a really important paragraph. 
It says, the fact is that most Alanonics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in their way of thinking. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first compulsive thought or obsessive thought. So this was certainly the case for me. Um, you know, again, I would tell myself I was going to stay out of the space. I was going to leave him alone. <laughs> I was going to uh, stop trying to tell him what to do and how to do it, that kind of thing, because it never went well. It's just like I'm not a slow learner, you know. Like it, <laughs> and I knew it wasn't going to go well, but then all of a sudden, you know, out of the clear blue sky, this thought would come into my head that now was a good time to help him see the light. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not being sarcastic. Like, literally, that's the way it would seem to me. Now's a good time for him to be able to see the light. And then I would say something stupid, and then we'd be off and running. And... I am not God, and he is not my child. You know what I mean? So for me to have been trying to control him, that was none of my business, and it was very disrespectful, right? So the next paragraph says, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alanonic tendencies like me, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. So human aid, when they refer to that in the big book, they're talking about anything that I could figure out to help myself and anything anybody else could figure out to help me. So when it came to my al human aid meant for me, uh, slogans were human aid, meetings were human aid, going to meetings to feel better. To, to solve this problem. They made me feel better for a short time, for the time I was at the meeting. But as a wholesale method of recovery, meetings by themselves were human aid solutions to me. Uh, therapy was another human aid solution. Um, all kinds of literature, more human aid solutions. Not diminishing any of the things I'm naming when I call them human aid solutions, all of them helpful, but none of them were enough to bring about the uh, spiritual awakening that I so sorely needed to recover from this problem that I had of wanting to control and fix everybody. Just, just didn't cut it. So on page 45, it says lack of power. That was our dilemma, right? That's my problem. I didn't have power over this thing. Wow, did I ever not? And I don't remember ever having power over the way my mind operated around other people. Um, it says we had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves because I'm not sufficient, right? Obviously, but where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Well, that is fantastic news, that they literally wrote a book to help people find a higher power, you know, for the people whose own willpower was insufficient, like me, they wrote a book to help us find a uh, higher power. And it worked for me, the instructions in this book, because I, I needed really simple, concrete instructions. So I've been talking about step one a lot. Um, and I usually do. Step one is so important because unless we are firmly convinced as to what step one is, for one thing, you know, number one, we lose control of this of this line of thinking once we engage in it, you know, this controlling line of thinking once we get started on it. And number two, um, I have no choice 
as to whether or not I get started on it again. I can resolve to never do it again, but I always got started on it again. If I've got those two ingredients, the loss of control and the loss of choice, then I qualify for step one without a doubt. Then the only question is, do I want to get better? Do I want to stop doing things the way I've been doing them? Or or is it still serving me some sort of a purpose? Is it still, you know, serving me well in some way? In my estimation, beginning in 2016, it was no longer serving me well, which is why, which is when I started trying to figure out a way to get this spiritual awakening. Um, couldn't find it until I stumbled on the big book in 2019, but, but thank God I finally did. So on page 47, it asks, this is going to be a step two question. We needed to ask ourselves, but one short question, do I now believe or am I even willing to believe there's a power greater than myself? Pregnant pause after that question, because it's not a hard question. I mean, if I walked up to somebody on the street, an absolute stranger, got nothing to do with a 12-step program, just walked up to someone on the street and said, do you believe there's a power greater than yourself? Chances are they're not going to think they themselves are the most powerful being in the universe. Most people can say yes to, to, the, to this question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe there's a power greater than myself? That's really how simple step two is to me, um, especially after I had been so firmly convinced that I was doomed with respect to step one, that my willpower was absolutely nil when it came to fixing this problem. I had no choice than to think that there might be a power greater than myself. And, and really, I had a leg up there because I had been talking to a sponsor who I had heard her story, and I could tell that she used to be as crazy as I was, and now she wasn't. And she had done the steps with her sponsor. And um, so this thing was working for her. So per me personally, I honestly didn't take a lot of time um, with step two. And if there's anybody on the line that wants to talk about step two longer. Maybe I should have taken a little longer talking about step two. I don't know. But if people are really firm with with step one, step two is just kind of a given. Like, you know, like they say in 12 step, step one is I can't. Step two is God can. And step three is I think I'll let him. I don't know about the I think I'll let him part. I've got a lot more to say about the step three part, but the step two, God can, I'm I'm totally on board with that. That's how simple it is. So I'm going to carry on with that. So step three, on page 60, it says, our description of the Alanonic, the chapter to the agnostic and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alanonic and could not manage our lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alanonism. So, you know, we can't manage our lives in that we keep deciding to not do this thing again and we keep doing it anyways. We have to be convinced that that's that's the state of affairs for us. And B, that, pro that no human power can relieve this problem. Human power being that human aid stuff. Like if we could, if we could go for therapy and then not behave like a crazy person around alcoholics or around anybody, then we don't need a 12-step program, right? Then that human aid solution does work and we're not powerless. But if it doesn't work, then, you know, we have to see the truth of that. And C is that God could and would if he were sought. 
Um, and we can insert higher power if there's anybody that, you know, it doesn't have to be a Christian God or anything. It's just a power greater than ourselves. Um, and then it says, being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. What do we mean by that? And what do we do? So, because I took so much time talking about step one, I'm running a little bit out of time for the other steps, but I am going to read a paragraph out of uh, the big book on page 60. It says, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will, which is the way I've been running my life, right, can hardly be a success. On that basis, we are almost always in collision with somebody or some something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Just trying to help, right? My motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. That was me, trying to arrange everything. If his arrangements would only stay put, if only, these are the if only, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor, being me, may sometimes be quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest, but as with most humans, he is more likely to have varied traits. So if we look at this paragraph, what does it boil down to? What it's saying is that we like to get our own way, period. We like to get our own way, right? When we don't get our own way, we don't like it. It's saying here in this paragraph that we may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. And most of the Al-Anons that I've come across are that way. I'm considerate, patient, and so on. They really genuinely believe they are trying to help. Um, I wasn't so much like that. <laughs> I was I was more like the second category, mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest person. But but most most Al-Anons that I come across are, you know, kind, considerate. You know, they're holding the family together. They're they're you know, they're just keeping it all together kind of thing. But why are they doing it? What is the motive? Because they're trying to get their own way. They're trying for the whole thing to go as they want it to go. Um, and I'm here to tell you that it doesn't work. <laughs> On page 62, it says selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. That's what happened when I would try to educate my husband. He would retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So when I first read this book many years ago, and I got to this paragraph, Selfish and Self-Centeredness, I was like, yes. I had a moment of clarity, clarity and I, I knew the truth of this paragraph as it related to me in that moment. Shortly after that, I forgot that truth. But um, it, when it says selfishness, like that word has a very negative connotation for us these days. But what it means is trying to get our own way, trying for things to work out the way we want them to work out. And 
you know, a lot of times these things are none of our business. When it talks about, you know, turn our will and our life over to God, what it's going to involve is firing ourselves as the boss of our own lives and the boss of other people's lives. You know, firing ourselves as the one that thinks they know they know all the answers and the one that, you know, knows the way things should be. It's going to be, you know, heading in the direction of a power greater than ourselves, maybe, that knows a little bit more than we do about the bigger picture. Because I only knew about a teeny tiny corner of the picture that only Terry Lynn knew about just a teeny tiny minuscule corner and my higher power knows about the whole big picture, right? So step three, I may say a few words next next uh, week about step three. I'm running out of time, but really all it is that it's, is a decision to carry on in the steps. Right now it's just a decision to carry on in the steps. and we we learn more about how to actually turn our will and our life over to God in the ensuing steps. So I'm going to close. Seventh tradition, every group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. This group does not have a payment structure in place and currently has no overhead expenses. If you would like to fulfill tradition seven, please direct contributions directly to the Al-Anon World Service Office by visiting al .org. For questions about this meeting, or if you're looking for a sponsor, please send emails to al Recovery at gmail.com. And that's al without the hyphen, al Recovery at gmail.com. Recordings can be accessed on YouTube by searching at al Step Speaker in the YouTube search box. If you're interested in other al meetings that follow the Big Book, please visit al BigBookSolutionGroup.org. Okay, I'm going to read from page 164 in the Big Book. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is so sick. The answers will come if, you're, if your own house is in order, but you obviously cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and for countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Now let's have a moment of silence for the Al-Anon who still suffers, followed by the Lord's Prayer, or a prayer of your own choosing, said in silence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The vine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.